and welcome to the Scotta Chronicast, the podcast which discusses all things relating to medieval Scotland. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Buchanan. This is episode nine, and I am honored to be joined by Dr. Rachel Delman. Welcome to the Scotta Chronicast. Hi, thanks very much for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining me today. I am very excited to hear more about your story. Would you mind telling the listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. So my name is Dr. Rachel Delman, and I'm a Leverheim Early Career Fellow in the Department of History and the Centre for Medieval Studies at the University of York. And here at York, my research looks at the relationship between gender and architecture in late medieval England and Scotland. And I'm particularly interested in women who commission buildings in spaces that are traditionally thought of as quite male or masculine. So I started Mm -hmm. off looking at castles and great houses um, and now my new project's looking more at urban settings. So I'm sort of thinking about how women express their their power and their agency through the built environment. Oh, that's super exciting research. I am very much looking forward to hearing more. So how did you start your journey towards studying medieval Medieval history and medieval Scotland. Oh, okay. So um, I actually came to medieval Scotland very recently. So I feel like a bit of an interloper on this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay. Anybody is welcome. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah, it's been been quite a long journey leading up to it. But I guess going back to sort of the earliest, um, my earliest interest in history, it was really, you know, at school, going on school trips to historic buildings. I know a, nu- a number of your other contributors have mentioned the impact that historic yeah. buildings had on them. It's so important. Yeah, exactly. And I think especially, you know, I'm not from a, a bookish or an academic family. Um, and I think being able to go to buildings, it's and historic sites is so important. Yeah. Because it gives you that tangible and that immediate link with the path. Yeah, having something that you can sort of access a little bit more readily is is super important. And I think when you're young um, and a child as well, it's it's a lot more helpful um, when you have the sort of visual and and tangible part of a historic site to really boost your imagination, as it were. Yeah, completely. I mean, I grew up in um, South London and I remember we went on a trip to Hever Castle in Kent when I was at primary mm-hmm. school um, and that's the home of Anne Boleyn and I, I remember just being really fascinated by this place and really sort of taken by it and going into the gift shop afterwards and buying a postcard I mean it all sounds really easy <laughs> now but I think I've still got the postcard somewhere I think it's in the attic in my mum's house oh good yeah so it made a real sort of lasting lasting impression on me yeah at school I think it was a bit a bit like Katie said you know a lot of school history is modern political history yeah and I remember we did a lot of that Italian unification um Roosevelt's America but I'd always really been interested in in an earlier time period and I remember thinking if I can just you know get through my exams and get through this I can get to university and yeah and study the period that really kind of sparks my interest yeah I um I ended up going to to Nottingham for my first degree and um like Amy actually I I studied English um English oh, okay. history. yeah so I I was mainly interested in literature but I took joint honors with okay well but I always, always thought I was going to be sort of more interested in the the literature side of things um, yeah funnily enough <laughs> did you study sort of medieval literature or just in general yeah I think one of the advantages of taking a joint honours course is that you can can pick and choose your options in each subject. So mm-hmm. the further I went through my degree, the more I was just selecting medieval modules. Right. So yeah, Gawain and the Green Knights, modules mm-hmm. of popular piety in late medieval England. Um, I think by my third year, I was doing pretty much exclusively medieval things. Yeah, I kind of have a similar in my undergraduate degree, I end up with a, a minor in English because I was taking all of the courses that were related to medieval anything. (laughs) Mm, Yeah, and I think there I really sort of developed through the literary side of things I developed an interest in in landscape and and gender Mm -hmm. and those themes and that basically took me on I decided I wanted to do a master's and I ended up going to Cambridge Uh and I I applied for a master's in an MPhil in in medieval history but I ended up working with a landscape archaeologist actually oh lovely so there I thought about uh, 
um, Margaret Beaufort, who's mother of Henry VII, I thought about her role in shaping a landscape at a palace called Collie Weston, which Mm -hmm. it no longer survives. It's in Northamptonshire. It's just a a field of sheep. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So many of these sites are. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's so frustrating, but it gives us something to do, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's true. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, the the earthworks of her... um, her designed landscape there they they survive essentially in this field of sheep and they've been recorded so yeah I looked looked at those for my um MPhil dissertation yeah yeah so after um after completing my dissertation at Cambridge I thought oh there must be there must be more women who were you know involved in commissioning landscape yeah so I ended up moving to to Oxford for my doctorate and the project quickly developed as it does into something quite different yes (laughs) Um, so I ended up in the first year actually of being in Oxford I applied to go on an architectural history summer school in the Netherlands and cool yeah, this was really amazing. And I think I, I got there and I realised that I can't really think about landscape without thinking about the buildings. Um, because, you know, the, the relationship between the two of them, the visual relationship, mm-hmm. the spatial relationship is so important. So I became increasingly interested in um, interior space as well as um, yeah. outdoor space. And so what the project ended up becoming was a study of the physical and social space of five residences, um, elite residences that were were headed by high status women Mm -hmm. and I basically looked at at the landscape but also you know the interiors the visual environment and the ways in which the women performed their authority as as heads of household oh that's cool were you working with Martin Hansen in the Netherlands no I wasn't actually this was just sort of 14 day course uh, with Conrad Hoffenheim I don't know if you know um, him he's an art historian but yeah I know of I know of Martin Hansen's work um, and it's been super useful for me actually in thinking about yeah power and space and those those questions yeah his work is great for that that's Mm. why I was like oh but maybe he's not from the Netherlands yeah I don't know but that's that's super cool that must have been a nice a jump start into to really looking at landscapes and the power that is being displayed yeah definitely and I guess the the thing that brought me to Scotland specifically I remember one day I was in the the history library in Oxford and I was looking at Joanna Lane Smith's book on late medieval queenship Mm -hmm. and next to it was Fiona Downey's book She Is But Uh, a Woman yes (laughs) Um, and I was I thought oh I have a flick through there and I'm really missing that at the moment you know being able to just go into libraries and browse the shelves because often they're the moments that when you find the the best discovery I know it's never something you're intentionally looking for but always a book that's like three shelves down and to the right of the one that you want or something yeah yeah completely so yeah I I was flicking through that and then I came across um, a chapter on Mary of Gelders and there's a, a short mention in there it says that she was responsible for um, building Ravenscraig Castle, mm-hmm. um, making some alterations to Falkland Palace as well, and also commissioning mm-hmm. uh, Trinity College Kirk in Edinburgh. Yeah, and I thought, well, this is great. She's another example of a woman who's you know quite a prolific builder. She's visible in the historical record as actually building stuff because you know often that's half the problem if we've got surviving right. yeah buildings. We don't necessarily have the document. So I remember going to my supervisor and saying, "Oh, I found another." the case study this is really exciting can, can she go in with my other women and he was like well she's in Scotland so you know it's a, a slightly different ball game um because mm-hmm. all the women I, I was looking at for the thesis were were in England so mm-hmm. Basically, I just created a file and parked her there for, <laughs> for a while. Scottish women. Yeah, file. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, on the desktop, you know, you know, as we do come across all these interesting tidbits and have to leave them there because otherwise the project would grow into something completely unmanageable. Yes, yes. It's hard to do. It's hard to, to, to do that. <laughs> yeah, it, oh, it really put them is. away. <laughs> say that I'll come back to you. I need to focus on this. It's very hard to <laughs> not get too distracted. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But yeah, then then once I'd finished the PhD, I was looking um, at applying for postdocs, and I uh-huh. saw that um, in Edinburgh, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities, known for short as IASH, mm-hmm. um, was advertising for you know ten month long fellowships to design a project and, and go up to Edinburgh 
And I thought, oh, this is where Ooh. where Mary could come in. Yeah, um, bring out that file. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I brought out the file um, and I wrote an application um, saying that I would look at questions of gender and power, similar to what I've been looking at for the doctorate, but mm-hmm. just, just focusing on, on Mary and her patronage. So yeah, it was an opportunity to spend, thankfully, very mild winter. It ended up being a very mild winter in, okay, in good. Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone said to me, "You're crazy. You're going there from from September to April." <laughs> rain. <laughs> That's the rain. worst oh. time to go to Scotland. So yeah, off I went with a suitcase full of thermals and my rain mac and extra <laughs> thick tights. Um, but yeah, thankfully the the weather wasn't wasn't too bad when I got up there. Oh, um, you were lucky then. Yeah, exactly. I was very lucky, but I, I ended up spending eight months living in Edinburgh and basically mm-hmm. looking at castles, going on site visit. Um, yeah, and, yeah, That's the best part. It definitely is, yeah. Yeah, looking at the, the buildings that she was responsible for, for creating during her time as regent. Yeah, that's fascinating. Cool. Yeah, so you spent eight months doing that. Did you end up doing a paper or anything come out of that research? Yeah, so I'm currently actually working on um, an article from that research but oh, my <laughs> but my main output during the fellowship was I organized a, a conference on women and materiality in late medieval and early modern Scotland oh excellent I, I do remember that conference being advertised I oh great was not was not able to to attend but <laughs> I remember looking at it and going <gasps> That sounds awesome. <laughs> well, I'm glad it's stuck in your mind. <laughs> so yeah, I realized there were um, lots of people working on really interesting themes to do with women's history, and particularly pre-modern women's history in Scotland, um, mm-hmm. and also to do with you know, material culture and the built environment. Um, but those two things haven't really been brought together in right. Scottish historiography in the way that they have for England and other parts of Europe. Mm-hmm. So I, I wanted the opportunity to, to bring together all these really interesting people. Um, and it was amazing that I, I was able to do that thanks to, to IASH being very generous with their funding. Yeah, that's great. Cool. I bet that was a, a really awesome conference. Yeah, I, I mean, I was really happy because I asked Elizabeth Ewan to give the keynote. Um, mm-hmm. um, thanks she said yes Yay. and Rosemary Goring as well who um, recently published Scotland's Her Story book mm-hmm. and, and gave a talk about you know promoting women's history to, to popular audiences all the curators from the National Trust for Scotland were there as mm-hmm. well um, and, and they were talking about the opportunities and the challenges of you know telling women's lives through through their properties right so yeah it was it was really great to bring all these different minds together and, and see you know all the themes and aspects that are coming out about women's history that haven't yet been explored. It's great. Cool. And is there, is the conference trying to, to publish any proceedings or, or is it just, it's done and dusted? Um, I think it's done and dusted, although I know subsequently people have gone on to do various things with their papers. Mm-hmm. So I know uh, Katie's just written an Oxford Dictionary of National Biography entry mm-hmm. on Isabella. And I know other people are are working their their contributions into articles and I'm also obviously writing up what I found during the fellowship as well so I'm sure it will will come out in various various outlets at various times. Excellent that's cool yeah for somebody who didn't make it to the conference it's nice to nice to know that I'll get to hear more about it um, eventually. (laughs) Great. So what are you working on now? I mean, aside from the paper as a result from that. So since moving to York, my my new project is on um, urban spaces and women's roles in shaping the urban urban environments. Mm -hmm. Thinking about women who commission not only towns houses, but chapels as well, um, arms houses, schools, and those sorts of things. Is that a little bit more difficult since you maybe don't have necessarily the the 
the records available or do you have you been finding a lot more records for that? Yeah, it is a bit trickier. It's just sort of approaching the topic in a in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. But one thing I was really uh, surprised to discover, actually, when I was up in Edinburgh, because another thing people said to me were, was, well, you know, and, and this is something that you've talked about with your, your previous contributors to the podcast, is that there are fewer sources for Scotland. Yeah. And so everyone told me it's going to be cold and you're probably not going to find very much. <laughs> oh, <laughs> encouraging me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but actually, what I was amazed to find was that part of Mary of Gelder's foundation of uh, Trinity Chapel still survives actually on a Chalmers Close, which is just tucked behind the the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. If you're you're walking down the Royal Mile, the castle's behind you. You've got the sea on the horizon in front of you. If you get down to the Museum of Childhood on mm -hmm. to, to your left, there's a little little alleyway, and that leads you to part of a, a 15th century chapel, and also to the 90s facade of of um, juries in as well so it's quite a long, quite a long <laughs> Kill, you know talking about killing two birds with one stone yeah. it. <laughs> but what essentially happened was that Mary's foundation was originally on the site of Waverley Station oh and when they when they built Waverley, the Victorians decided to dismantle the chapel and put all the stones, they numbered all the stones, a bit like an Ikea flat pack. <laughs> <laughs> they, they put them up on Carlson Hill, but I guess gradually they just sort of dispersed and then eventually they weren't sure about where to put the you know, rebuilt version of the chapel. So uh -huh. they ended up just rebuilding the apse of the chapel, one, one part of it on Chalmers Close. Right. But still, you know, it's it's really amazing that that's still there and you can go and get a sense of how, just how grand it would have been right. um, and see this little snippet of Gothic architecture in the centre of, <laughs> of Edinburgh. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, <laughs> I like... I, I do really love stories where these structures have just been moved. I know. <laughs> it's like, we don't like where it is. We're just going to move it. Yeah, we'll just, just put it somewhere. We'll just build a really grand station, but we'll we'll destroy a, a beautiful chapel in the process. It'll all be fine. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. But yeah, then an, another one I actually realized was the um, Maudlin or Magdalene. I'm not entirely sure how you pronounced it. The, the chapel on Cowgate uh -huh. um, in Edinburgh, just, just by the grass market. That's also mm -hmm. a pre-Reformation chapel that a woman had a hand in, in building. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so um, she was a, a merchant's wife, Janet Rind. She was the widow of Michael McQueen. Um, and in the 1530s, she took over the responsibility when he died for building this chapel, essentially. Right. But she, she turned it into her own own project and oh, cool. added a hospital. And her tomb is actually the only the only tomb that survives in there now. I mean, it's been much altered oh. since the 16th century. And you do have to look hard for it. It's um, covered by a carpeted slab. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's quite the metaphor for women's history, really. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That yeah. is true. <laughs> But yeah, nevertheless, it's it's pretty amazing that a pre-Reformation woman's tomb and chapel survives again in the heart of Edinburgh. Um, so it's amazing what you can find if, if you look look hard enough. Yeah, no, that's that's super interesting. Cool. So what what kind of sources are you finding that are are showing that these women are, are sort of taking over the projects and going mm. on their own um, ideas? Yeah. So um, for the the higher status buildings, I was lucky enough to have um, household and building accounts, and that's how I could um, attribute you know, the women's agency to these spaces, essentially. Now I'm looking at a variety of sources. During lockdown, I've been looking at a lot of wills um, mm. because the, the National Archives have thankfully made their um, some of their wills available, the database available online. So I've been... Oh, excellent. Yeah, downloading quite a lot of those <laughs> and looking at how women describe, you know, the, the houses that they're living in. Sometimes they describe the, the goods in quite a spatial way. So they tell you what's in each room. Mm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they talk about they're they're making payments for the mending of highways or you know the repair of parts of the church or um, mm -hmm. the foundation of an almshouse, for example. So yeah, they, those have been the main main sources that I've been focusing on at the moment. That's cool. Yeah, and it's oh, it's so 
so valuable when <laughs> when sources are digitized. Yeah. For lockdown, for sure, um, for everybody that is there, but also um, for those of us that live very, very far away and still want to, to actually look at some things. Oh, it's exciting to still be able to do that. It is, yeah, because I, I really miss that experience of going to the archives and, you know, opening a box and that, that wonderful musty smell you get and, and of, yes. of not knowing what you're going to find. And <laughs> yeah, just, just the whole experience of it. I mean, it's not quite the same when you're you're downloading things, but looking at the originals no. and, and knowing that you're looking at something that could potentially be an exciting find, it does slightly give you that sense of excitement. Yeah, with a little bit, yeah, it's not quite as exciting, but you also don't end up with the same sort of like dreading, I, I don't know, I always am like, oh, I'm so excited to touch these original sources, but I'm yeah. also terrified I'm going to like, I don't know, gonna break them. In your hand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that's so true. <laughs> Which is, you know, not something that I mean, they're actually medieval documents are, are really sturdy. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and they've, they've survived for a long time as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm always just like, oh no, I don't. Should I be trusted with this? Yeah, I mean, I guess I should be trusted with this, but give me all the weights, all the the stakes, and everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah, so I'm I'm just kind of like racking my brain um and like the only aside from royal women being involved in in building things the only one that I kind of had been vaguely aware of and I'm not even sure now I'm sort of like mm, this might be false information that's in your head. Mm. Um <laughs> it was Sweetheart Abby. Uh, and I have yes. This recollection that uh what was her name? D Divorge Yes, yeah. Of, of um, is it Gal Galloway? Galloway. Galloway. Yeah. Divorge Gila of Galloway. I don't even know how. You, that's probably not how you say her name. But yeah, I just I I remember that she was heavily involved in the founding of Sweetheart Abbey. Mm, yeah, she was. She's a little bit earlier. Um, I'm I'm mostly focusing on the 15th and the early 16th centuries. But yeah, these, yeah. these examples of earlier women are also, you know, really interesting for me for thinking about um, the the same sorts of themes of you know how how women are circumventing the patriarchal yeah. power structures and and still <laughs> being able to to express themselves through material culture. Yeah, and having that like con context and, and looking at, you know, what maybe there's a precedence for this sort of work and that sort of thing. That's mm -hmm. well that's really cool. Yeah. So do you have any future plans for doing more work on this in Scotland? Or I guess you're still working on the sort of urban stuff. Yeah, yeah. So actually things keep bringing me back to my um my Scottish research. I've been, been yeah, <laughs> I've been working with um Historic Environment Scotland. Um so we've done a mm -hmm. bit of work with them to, you know, insert women's stories into some of their properties. Um oh, good. Yeah, so I did one one project on um Margaret Tudor's connections to Lynn Lithgow. Excellent. Um, and another one thinking about women's experiences of, of childbirth in medieval Scotland. Um and that's going to inform some of the interpretation at Calaveral as well. Oh, excellent. Um, and there's also just recently been a very exciting discovery. It's been some dendrochronology done mm -hmm. on the tower of St. Giles Cathedral. Oh, cool. And it turns out that it was rebuilt. The tree ring dating from the dendrochronology mm -hmm. indicates that it was most likely rebuilt in the early 1460s. Oh, wow. Yeah, which is when Mary of Gelders was, was regent. Yeah. So it looks like she may have been responsible um, and Karali Mills actually who was was responsible for carrying this out she's written about this on her blog um mm -hmm. and so Mary of Gelders may have been there at least one of the patrons for the rebuilding of of the tower at St Giles so oh, it just yeah I think things keep bringing me back to to Scotland excellent <laughs> <laughs> I I always think that it you know it just like I don't know medieval Scottish history like gets its its claws almost stuck into you and then it, <laughs> it won't fully ever let you go. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very true. That's exactly what I'm finding at the moment. So, and I'm always happy for an excuse to to come back up. I I love Edinburgh and I love love visiting the sites that I look at in Scotland. So so yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very pleased. <laughs> cool. So, are you able to sort of work any of this into Teaching? Are you teaching? I guess is a, <laughs> a first question I should ask. 
Um, yes, yeah, so I am. I'm. I'm mostly a research <laughs> fellow. Um, so my main responsibility is basically to write another right. another book. I'm okay. working on the thesis book and then trying to work on the the new book at the same time. Um, oh, that's ambitious. Spinning many plates. Um, but yeah, I do. I do do a little bit of teaching as part of my fellowship. I teach a, a first year module on on medieval lives, which introduces the students to particular historical characters um, and then mm-hmm. a theme related to them. So, for example, Margaret Beaufort and then the Wars of the Roses. And I also teach um, a very lucky and that York is a bit like Vicky was saying uh, a few weeks ago about Bristol York mm-hmm. are very keen for research-led teaching oh good so yeah I have my own own MA module uh, which is on masculinities and femininities in late medieval Europe um, oh, that's we, fascinating yeah we look at various themes relating to gender and I incorporate you know the, the material culture into that and the architecture and I also have snuck in a few Scottish things along the way. Um, it's, it's not explicitly <laughs> on Scotland, but I think, right. you, you know, sometimes there's this issue if we try and siphon off Scottish history. Yeah. You know, it, I think in some ways it's it's much better to try and integrate it into a thematic approach. Yeah, because, I mean, they were part of the, the full context of, of medieval Europe, trying yeah. to isolate isolate it doesn't give you the full picture yeah exactly so um elizabeth ewan's work you know as, as lucy said previously she's been such a pioneer mm-hmm. um so a lot of her work is on on the reading lists excellent yeah cool well that's great do you have a recommendation for one of your favorite sites to visit in scotland oh um yes i particularly love lynn lithgow Actually, I love how I don't want to say uncurated because I don't want to imply that historic environment Scotland don't don't do anything. Right. But I love how it's a sort of bare bones site that you yeah. can just, you know, get lost in and spend time reimagining what it what it would have been like and let your imagination run wild. And just the, the landscape setting's amazing as well, next to the church, um, over oh, yeah. in the loch. Yeah. Yeah, it's um definitely one that I think really really struck me when I when I arrived in Scotland that would be that would be my gem yeah and it's very easily accessible because you can take a train right there and you're I don't know just a few steps away it seems like it's probably more than that but (laughs) I feel like you could just like walk off the train platform and you're almost at Linlithgow Palace (laughs) yeah exactly and for me I don't have a car so that's yeah definitely an added bonus for me being able to 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 be right there quite quite quickly from Edinburgh yeah yeah it's a it's also a great little town seem to remember there being a lot of interesting like coffee shop cafe and various shops and things as well so it's it's a good stop Mm. And there's a local museum there as well that um, talks about yeah. the history of the town. So that's worth a, a visit. I don't know, obviously, if it's open at the moment. Well, but yeah, when it when it does reopen, it is it's worth going to have a look at. Yeah, that's a good that's a good suggestion. I always kind of forget about it as well because it's just like for me, it's just one of the obvious sites. Um, but I always forget that it's <laughs> it's one to actually recommend to people. Yeah, and you can um, you can actually visit the uh, the Magdalen or Magdalene Chapel on Cowgate as well. Um, mm. I think it's got quite limited opening times, but that's really worth going into, even though much of the medieval fabric has been stripped away. Right. And, you know, it's it's still one of those hidden gems that you don't, you just probably walk, walk past quite regularly and, and don't really think about going in. So, and you can even find Janet Ryan's tomb under that carpeted slab as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, look out for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Thank you very much for for joining me today to chat about how you you came to Scottish history, even though it wasn't your intended um, sort of <laughs> research initially. And I'm very much looking forward to reading um, more of your work when it when it comes out. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for having me. It's been a, a real pleasure. The Scotta Chronicast is just one of many things relating to the Middle Ages that can be found on Medievalist.net. Check them out if you're interested at all in learning more about medieval history. If you like what you see and hear on Medievalist.net and want to see and hear even more, consider being a patron on Patreon.com. Thank you for joining us on the Scotta Chronicast. Please rate and review wherever you get your podcasts, and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. 
You can also follow our account on Twitter, at Scottachronicast. Our music is Ex to Lux Oratur by Gaeta. Thanks for listening. 